I'm Kathy Wren at AAAS, the nonprofit science society that publishes the journal Science. I'm talking today with Dr. Jack Warren and Dr. Chris Desjardins, both of the University of Rochester and both co-authors of a study that will appear in Science this week. Let's begin with Dr. Desjardins. You and your colleagues have sequenced the genomes of three closely related species of parasitic wasps in the genus Nasonia. Could you please tell us a little bit about Nasonia and why you find these wasps so interesting? Well, uh, as you said, Nasonia is a parasitic wasp, and parasitic wasps are insects that lay their eggs uh, on or inside other insects, and then the egg hatches and the larvae uh, develops by uh, eating the host from inside and out. Um, and these are incredibly diverse organisms. There's estimated to be over 600,000 species of parasitoids. It's just most of them are very small and inconspicuous. Uh, a lot of them are just a couple millimeters long. So even though they're flying all around your backyard, you probably never even noticed them. Uh, but they're really important um, in the regulation of uh, agricultural pests. They're used a lot in what's called biological control, uh, which is where you use uh, nature instead of uh, chemical pesticides to control pest populations. And a question for Dr. Warren. Nasonia is also particularly important for genetics research. Why is that? Well, Nasonia is kind of the lab rat for parasitic wasps. It's a really good uh, lab organism. It's easy to work with and rear. But they have, uh, all wasps have this uh, interesting genetic feature, uh, and it's called ha male haploidy. So for organisms like, uh, like us, we have two sets of chromosomes. We get one from mother and one from father, sort of like we have an extra copy in case one of the genes is bad or doesn't work quite right. We have a backup copy. Now, parasitoid wasps, the females have two sets of, uh, of chromosomes, but males are derived from an, a, a, an unfertilized egg, so they only have one. Now, uh, this is really useful for a geneticist because it means that we can see the effect of a gene all by itself without having another gene there to kind of complicate the story. And we can also find how genes interact with each other. So that makes it a really helpful genetic tool, particularly when, when you want to study complex traits that involve many genes that interact together. Now that you have the three genome sequences, could you talk a little about how this information might be useful for some of the practical problems you mentioned earlier involving pest control, for example? Well, one idea that I'm excited about, it's a very long-term idea, and that is uh, that uh, it would be very good for us to domesticate parasitoids. So we've domesticated so many animals and plants, you know, cows and dogs and corn and rice. Uh, and yet these very important insects out in nature, there are hundreds of thousands of species of these things. We have yet to domesticate them. And so using some of the genetic information that have emerged from this study and others, uh, there's a good prospect that we can begin to harness these animals to use them to, to better control pests. I like to think of them as smart bombs. They actually go out and seek out and kill particular insects which is vastly preferable to our current way of controlling pests, which is to broadcast toxins into the environment. And what do these genomes tell us about evolution? Well, a couple of, there have been a couple of cool stories to come out of the genomes. Uh, the first thing is that in order to, we wanted to study evolution on a relatively short time scale, and that's why we sequence the genomes of three species. And by looking at these genomes, we can see what kinds of genes have evolved very quickly in the short time frame that the species diverged. And one of the things that we found is that the, uh, uh, the nuclear genes that evolve very, very quickly interact with the mitochondria, which is a special organelle in the cell that produces energy, which has its own DNA. And so these two things, the mitochondria DNA and the nuclear DNA, are evolving really, really quickly in these wasps, so that when you bring the closely related species together, there are problems, what we call incompatibilities, between their mitochondrial DNA and their nuclear DNA that interacts with it. The second thing we found, which is really cool, is that the wasps are picking up DNA from viruses and other bacteria and using these as potentially new gene functions. And we don't quite know what those are doing in the wasps, but it illustrates this important principle that one way that animals can acquire novel evolutionary uh, processes is by picking up genes from other organisms. Let's turn back now to Dr. Desjardins, who I understand that you figured out which genes are involved in producing the wasp's venom. 
Yeah, so uh, we characterized a very uh, diverse complement of venoms in Nisonia. Uh, if you think of a lot of stinging insects like honeybees uh, or ants, their venom has one specific purpose, which is to cause pain. And therefore, their venoms are really simple. Uh, but a parasitoid venom is very complex uh, because when the par parasitoid lays its egg on a host, it's got to uh, inject venom that's going to change the physiology of the host. Uh, so they can often change the behavior of the host. Uh, Nisonia, for example, um, it stimulates fat production. So when the Nisonia venom goes in a host, its host fly uh, eventually becomes basically an enormous bag of fat. Um, so there's all kinds of really interesting uh, uh, physiological effects that parasitoid venom has. And, you know, by characterizing these venoms in Nisonia, we've sort of opened up this new window, which I think is going to uh, bring forth a lot of compounds with potential agricultural and medical uses. Well, thank you both very much for talking with me today.